Getting Started How Video Games Are Made Playing video games is a popular pastime for people of all ages. For most people, their video game journey begins at the Apple, Google Play Store, Steam, or video game store and ends at the couch. So it's easy to think games are no more than simply electronic toys and can be made with a few clicks of the mouse. But in reality, getting a game in the hands of consumers is oftentimes a very long and tenuous journey that can take years from start to finish. Nowadays, video games combine all the greatest elements of art and entertainment and place them in an interactive medium that can draw the player in and create a unique experience. Whether it's the addictive thrill of a multiplayer shooter the cooperative camaraderie of an MMO, or the wonder and immersive storytelling of an RPG. Video games are one of the only mediums that not only allow us to watch, but interact, influence, and exist within their worlds. So how do they do it? How are games really made? Whether you're looking to create a small indie game, a mobile game, or work with a large AAA studio, the basic sequence of creating a game will remain pretty much the same and falls in these three stages. Pre-production, production, and post-production. Pre-production phase. Pre-production is the first phase of the video game development production cycle, and it is critical to defining what your game is, how long it will take to complete, how many people and or resources you'll need, and how much everything will cost. In a professional environment, pre-production can last from one week to more than a year, depending on the size and complexity of the project. A good way to gauge how long your pre-production should be is, pre-production should be 10 to 20% of the total estimated time of the game development. So if you're working on an eight-month project, your pre-production should last a few weeks to over a month. The three biggest components in pre-production are the concept, the plan, and prototypes. Every game begins with an idea. Whether your idea or concept is born from a story you've been dying to tell, a unique form of gameplay you'd love the world to experience, or a new piece of technology that you feel will really make your game stand out, a good idea is always the start of the pre-production process. The plan is where all the information is put together and fleshed out. In many professional studios, this will be recorded in what we call a game design document. The purpose of design documentation is to fully express the vision for the game, describe the contents, ensure the team members understand their roles and map out a production plan. That being said, game design documents are usually extremely long and detailed, and can be quite time consuming to complete start to finish. However, there's a fair amount of debate in the industry on the actual effectiveness of a game design document. This is mainly due to the fact that no matter how well you document and plan a game, many elements will change drastically during the pre-production and production phases. This can happen for a variety of reasons. Sometimes it's due to technical limitations, game mechanics not working well together, hardware or software limitations, or even key developers or artists leaving the project. Thankfully, over the last few years, many studios and developers seem to be acknowledging this and have began adopting the much smaller, simpler, and more flexible macro design document. A design concept spearheaded by Mark Cerny, the lead architect and producer of Sony's PlayStation 4 and PlayStation Vita, as well as a game industry veteran who's designed such titles as Uncharted, God of War 3, and Killzone 3, just to name a few. A macro design document is a very short one or two page plan that contains high level descriptions and can be expanded upon as needed over the course of the game's development. Whether you start with a full game design doc or a macro design doc, at the very least your plan should include the game concept, the core game mechanics, gameplay features, gameplay breakdown, and project scope breakdown. The main goal of pre-production is not only to plan and fully flesh out your ideas, but also to prototype and test these ideas. Prototyping is creating a rough, functionable test of your game's mechanics, functions, TEC, and or art direction. In the early prototyping phase, actual game and art assets are unnecessary. Functions and mechanics can be tested using primitive objects from the game engine, free or purchased stand-in assets. One of the keys to success in developing any game is to prototype a lot and prototype often. This is especially important to new developers, or when developing a feature or function you're unfamiliar with. Prototyping is extremely important in the pre-production process, 
because prototyping is a very easy way to find your team's limitations and determining whether you'd like to work around these limitations or extend your production time to overcome them. Prototyping is key to helping you or your team set and establish a realistic planned timeline of how long it will take to complete your game. It can also better help you find the most enjoyable and unenjoyable aspects in your core gameplay mechanics. Production Phase Production is the main and longest stage of game development at which point the game is actually developed. In a professional environment, this is the phase where new staff and team members are hired for the various roles and new positions. The production phase is focused on content, asset, and code creation, as well as implementing content and completing the various tasks needed in a game's development. One of the most challenging aspects during this phase is balancing creativity with time management. Creating a game in an environment or team that can have fun, be creative and experimental while staying on track is quite challenging. However, achieving this balance is how great games are made. The game production phase can be best summed up into these five categories, vertical slice, pre-alpha, alpha, beta, and gold. Vertical Slice A vertical slice is a section of the game, perhaps 5 to 30 minutes, that is representative of what the final game will look, sound, and play like. The vertical slice is an industry-wide practice, especially when it comes to large-scale game projects. For many large developers, its main purpose is to be used as a pitch when talking to studio heads to help them decide whether the game gets funded or not. However, even if you have no desire to find a publisher or additional funding, a vertical slice is a great tool to begin early testing and marketing of your project. Additionally, creating a small finalized portion of the game will help you or your team better gauge how long the game's development time will be which in turn will help you not only set a more realistic release date, but also help when creating deadlines and milestones during the production phase. Pre-alpha. In game development, pre-alpha refers to all activities performed during the game's development, but before official testing. This stage is where the majority of the content gets made. It's at this point where the artists create the characters and environments, animators bring the characters and creatures to life with movement, designers lay out the map and levels, and the programmers bring it all together by scripting all the functions, events, and interactions. During this stage, it's important to keep in mind that you should work on all the most important core game elements first. Typically, things will have to be cut during a game's development due to a variety of circumstances, but the most common ones are time and suitability. In the case of time, it's pretty straightforward, though in a professional environment, oftentimes, it's time versus impact rather than not having enough time to finish or implement something. So essentially it boils down to, is this worth spending your time on, or rather, will not having this impact the game or the player's experience in a negative way? And if the answer is no, is your time better spent on something that will impact the game or the player? Content cut for suitability reasons usually refers to stuff that just didn't fit well with the finalized state of the game. Oftentimes, the game you or your team started out to make isn't quite the game you end up with. This can happen for a number of reasons, and oftentimes the end result is far better than originally conceptualized. That being said, sometimes older or current assets or functions no longer fit, work well, or turn out to be just not fun so they no longer suit the game in its current state. Alpha The alpha phase begins when the game is feature complete. At this point, the game is fully playable from start to finish, for the most part. However, during this phase, it's common to have a few missing components as well as art assets in place that aren't finalized. But the controls, functionality, and interface should be in a finalized state. The alpha stage is about finishing and polishing the game rather than building or creating additional content. In a professional environment, it's about testing and reaching the release date at this point. So if any feature or function needs to be dropped or minimized in order to do so, it would be at this stage. During Alpha, the testing or QA department is in charge of ensuring each game mode, mechanic, function, and performance work properly and record any inconsistencies, malfunctions, performance issues, or errors in a bug sheet or bug database. Beta. After the game has passed the alpha phase, 
it enters the beta phase. During this phase, the focus is on fixing bugs and the game is considered content complete. All assets are integrated into the game and the entire production process ceases. The goal during beta is to stabilize and optimize the project if need be and eliminate as many bugs as possible before the game is launched. At this point, it's best to prioritize the bugs from high to low, with high being game-breaking or quality-offending, and low being minor annoyances or small bugs that are extremely hard to replicate. In the beta phase, stability is your main goal. Gold. Once the game has passed the beta phase, it is considered gold. This is the point where all your weeks, months, or years of hard work are paid off. At this point, the final game is sent to be tested by your publishing outlet, and if it's found to be acceptable, it's released to the public. In the past, this would be the point where you and your team go into post-production and have a chance to relax and enjoy the fruits of your labor for a bit, before you start on your next project. However, now in many studios, members of the team will transition to working on bonus or downloadable content, game patches, or other projects in development. Irregardless, once you get to this point, you've officially released a game, which is a major accomplishment all in itself. Post-Production Contrary to popular belief, the game development process doesn't end when the game is complete and released. Oftentimes, during the post-production phase, several subsequent versions or patches might be released that replace or improve upon the original game. A patch can be created and applied to fix software bugs or address performance issues. However, two of the most important aspects of post-production are the post-mortem and the closing kit. Post-mortem Learning from experience is the best way to improve the game development process for the future and one of the methods of doing so is conducting a post-mortem at the end of the production process. Even if your game wasn't released or finished, a post-mortem can still be a useful tool in learning from your mistakes and taking that knowledge to the next game you work on. After the game is released, or the project is finished, a post-mortem is essentially a meeting with you and your team that gives everyone the opportunity to discuss the ups and downs of development, and how the process and approach can be approved in the future. The main purpose of a post-mortem is to learn what methods worked and what didn't work during the game development process. In a post-mortem, it's important not to point fingers or place blame on any individuals or set of team members. Instead, focus on the production process, scheduling, planning, time management, implementing features, and so forth. The main question you should ask yourself or your team during a post-mortem is, did we achieve the original goal of the game we set out to produce? What went right? What went wrong? Was the project scope, deadlines, milestone, feature set, and quality expectations realistic when originally planned? And were we able to meet or achieve or exceed those? What are some of the lessons we learned during development? As important as postmortem is to highlight the production shortcomings in order to improve upon them in the future, it's also equally as important, if not more so, to highlight and praise all the accomplishments of you or your team were responsible for. Closing Kit During post-production, it's important that you or your team organize all the game's source assets and code into what we call a closing kit, so it's readily available for future use or reference. The closing kit is simply a compilation of all the design documents, code, art, final game assets, music files, and everything else that was used to create the game. Closing kits are especially useful if you or your team ever plan on creating a sequel or extended content such as DLC to your game. Several years ago, game development was a lot less complex, and a game could be thought up and developed in less than a few months. Nowadays, game production is a lot more challenging, and depending on its size, can take teams of hundreds of people several years to develop. To make matters worse, no matter how good a team or idea is, unfortunately, there's no standard process to ensure the successful completion of every game. Even games that have been successfully released usually have several bumps along the way. So remember, game production is not a science. Each game you work on will present new challenges. However, while game production may not be a science and differ from game to game, common elements do exist in all game development. So learning from and knowing how to anticipate these challenges 
is what makes good game designers, developers, and producers.